All right, everybody. Thanks for coming. Glad you all are here. Uh, welcome to Living Web Farm Farms. This particular farm is Grandview uh, Grandview Farm. We do mostly grass-based, pasture-raised uh, sheep and hogs and cattle and stuff like that. You know, I'll I'll tell you all any any and everything I know and ever have done and all the mistakes I've made and so on and so forth with with raising hogs. And we'll hang out in here for a little bit, we'll talk, we'll chat, we'll go through some stuff, and then we'll go outside and we'll go look at the pigs we have now and talk a little bit more about infrastructure and kind of put our eyes on stuff, boots on the ground, look at some pigs. Then we're gonna have, then we're gonna leave here and we're gonna go to uh, another property of the farms, which is right down the road. I'll give you directions and we're gonna have lunch and then we're gonna do some butchery. Originally, my background is, is in vegetables at the other property we're gonna visit later on. Um, and then I slowly and surely kind of got into uh, pasture-based animals. We started with uh, six head of cattle, a bunch of layers, uh, you know, and we've, we did a breeding chicken, uh, and layers and broilers. We bred chickens for a while. We bred heritage chickens, heritage turkeys for a while. Uh, at one point we had quite a, quite a bit of turkeys out here. Um, I, you know, I'm coming from the same place. I had a mild interest in pigs. I visited some farms and, and said to myself, without ego, you know, you know, they're not doing anything that I don't think I can do. All I lack is doing it. Um, and got some pigs. I guess I got my first pigs maybe th three years ago or so, and I've had a couple around pretty much ever since. Um, we've done some ourselves. We've butchered some ourselves. We've sold some. So, you know, kind of have that, that spectrum. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's about it for me. Um, so, <clears throat> why raise pigs outdoors? Well, you know, pigs, I think it really improves the quality of the of the meat. I think it really uh, it allows them and it gives them an ability to 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 kind of forage for themselves, to root around for themselves, find food on their own. Um, and you know, really, I think that pigs are an intelligent enough animal that that they can they can appreciate that um, as opposed to kind of a confinement. Hogs, which which a lot of folks start out with, um, and you know it's not too uncommon to see, you know, a pig pen or pigs in a in a small space raised on concrete or whatnot. And I, I'm not really here to say what's right and what's wrong. I just think that when you allow them to go outside, you get a lot of benefits to your to your farm and land as well uh, if they're you know if they're managed properly. When you add a species to your farm, you inadvertently introduce anywhere from six to 10 other species. And then that diversity helps to, uh, you know, helps bring a lot, of, a lot of natural life to your farm and kind of helps keep your place in, in balance, if you will, um, as opposed to more of a mono culture or mono kind of just a single, uh, single animal place. We here are small enough. This whole property is, I think, 34 acres. Um, you know, we're small enough to where we can have, or we choose to, uh, a fair amount of, of different animals. And that diversity really helps. And, and pigs can be a, a great part in that natural system and in that natural cycle. Every animal is gonna have some kind of impact on your land. Pigs, uh, you know, hogs are the most kind of physically destructive, I think. You know, you should all know anything one foot above or below soil level is fair game. You know, so just kind of keep that, that kind of thing in mind. When we go and look at them, we'll, you'll be able to see a couple things. For what we're doing here in this system um, is trying to incorporate them into, into a bigger picture and bring the pigs uh, <clears throat> 
in a smaller set of land. This is going to happen later on this year, but confining them to a smaller space and so they do a little bit more rooting around and a little bit more destruction is certainly the wrong word, but more, more rooting, more earthing, and then move them quickly. And then we can follow that with, with some stuff from our vegetable program, maybe a cover crop or some sheet mulching or stuff like that. And also let them go in there and get, they're really great for um, root crops. Like we've got some potatoes going, some sweet potatoes. And if you put them in there after that, let them turn that up and then follow that with a cover crop. You know, that really helps to, uh, uh, that allows them to do what they want to do, and that helps us not to have to go do what we would otherwise have to do. So we're scratching each other's back in that, in that sense. Um, and then things like that are gonna, you know, things like that are gonna depend, and, and it's all gonna come down to on what works for you and what your goals are and what you want to do. Um, right now our pigs are in pasture and woods, they're just kind of hanging out there. Um, I'm not really, at this moment, I'm not really using them to do much with the land. That's not, that's not their specific purpose. Um, and I'm not really managing them in such a way to help build soil. Uh, but at the same time, they are bringing in diversity and they are adding fertility. And I just think that, uh, you know, I think outdoor pigs uh, do better. I think they're a lot less prone to disease and sickness. A lot of that's going to depend on your breeds. They really taste a lot, a lot better as well, just getting that diversity and whatnot. Let's talk for a second about, about infrastructure. The boundary of this place, uh, of this property line, is, uh, is six strands of electric high tensile wire. Um, we keep it pretty hot. We keep it, you know, the voltage high. High volts, low amps. Uh, we have six strands because we have sheep. You do not need six strands for pigs. Uh, the pig lot has three strands, and that's probably, that, that, that's probably one too many. Um, most folks I know get away with two, and they don't have any issues. Um, if, you're, if you choose or if you hope to have them in a s smaller area, there are some other fence, uh, fence, fencing options. Uh, fencing with pigs can, can definitely be a, a challenge. The electric fence is a total, it's a total mental, physical barrier. It's a mental barrier, not physical. I misspoke because they can get through it like that if they choose to. It's not like that lone little thing of wire is strong enough to keep a 300 pound hog out. Um, if you're in a smaller area, if you don't want to go with electric, that's fine. Um, there's, there's things called hog panels. I'll show them to you later. They're, they come from three to six feet tall. They get thinner at the bottom and a little bit further apart horizontally as they go up. Um, and those work really well as well for a small, smaller area. Um, if we'll pretend for a second, this is how, this is how I train pigs to electric fence. Um, in case y'all wanna know this. Pretend for a second, I'm sorry I don't have a chalkboard or something. Pretend my torso is this area where the pigs are, right? It's however big and however many pigs, that kinda doesn't matter. So right here is the food. And right here is the water. And right in the middle, going about three quarters of the way down, is a hot electric fence. So when they're over here and they want to drink, if they go directly across that fence, they get hit. They get electrocuted. So they have to go all the way down, all the way over here to get a drink, and all the way down, all the way up here to get some food. Um, I have trained pigs like that. It works well. It doesn't take long um, you know I, I don't want to romanticize I don't I don't have any idea how many times out in the night they're out there getting hit but I've never seen a pig do it more than twice <laughs> most of them are just ones I'll tell you all I'll tell you all something you might you might want to write this down you might not if a pig gets electrocuted in front of his ears 
he or she will back up. If a pig gets electrocuted behind their ears, they will go forward. Learn that lesson the hard way. The challenge to that is that 95% of a pig is behind its ears. So when you're training them, and you might have to adjust your fence as they grow, and you might not, I've never had to adjust mine. But when you're training them, there's two things. Make sure your fence is hot. Make sure your fence is running at, at its maximum. Um, and, you know, make sure that that level is right where they're gonna get hit, right on their nose. And, you know, as precise as you can. Look at where your, your animal is, see how far off the ground the nose is, and put it there. My first strand is about eight inches off the ground, six to eight inches. Um, and then I've got another one, I think, 18 inches up. Pigs don't have a great vertical jump. So what I mean is, uh, I'm not saying it's never happened, but I've never seen or heard it that they take a big run and go and jump over a fence. Um, they're strong animals though, for sure. And that's something to keep in mind too, if you're ever working with them or anything. They're really dense, really low to the ground, real low center of gravity. They're real strong, strong little animals. Or not little, but they're strong animals. Um, fencing sources, there's a, there's two, uh, there's two companies that, that I use. Uh, one is Premier Fencing, they're on the internet, and another one is called PowerFlex Fencing. But there's also this electric net type of fencing for hogs. It's shorter and the, the squares are, 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 are bigger. Um, if you want to move them, like I was saying earlier, uh, that's another option as well. They can help you with uh, chargers. You know, if you're doing miles and miles of perimeter fence, or if you're just doing one of these little things, they can help you with that as well. PowerFlex, they, they're a little bit more for reels, electric reels and stuff, like for cattle. Within your area, there's probably a, you know, an ag store, a feed and seed type shop, and they can help you out with stuff like that too. Or if you need to pick up one little thing, uh, they can help you out with that as well. So if you know of anyone, or, or maybe can meet someone here, or, or anything like that, or if you can network with folks who are doing the same kind of thing, or putting an order together, it really does help to have a couple folks go in on an order, you get whatever you need individually, but you split the cost of shipping. That really, that really helps. Do you use all the rope fencing, wire rope? Um, I've never used it for hogs. Um, this Works stuff? Great. That stuff. So this is, and this is mainly what we do for the sheep and whatnot, but basically this whole thing reels out. It's just like a big, you know, it's a big reel. It's like a big fishing reel. And then I hook this on the fence and I can put this wherever I want it. And then there's a, I'll grab one here in a second, but there's, there's an assortment of temporary posts and you just, they're just stepping posts and you put it on the level that you want it. Um, yeah, yeah, and they do, they do work well for, they work really well for, for pigs. And th those things are really great. And again, that's gonna come down to what you're hoping to achieve. The perimeter fence is my canvas. Those things can be your paintbrush. You know, you can have animal impact wherever you want it on your farm. And, and those are a great tool. We do ours with just one, one wire too. Yeah. That's yeah, amazing. yeah, that's great. I was just saying, I've got, I've got three, and it's, it's overkill, yeah. and it's that training, it's that mental barrier, because they see that wire, they remember, when they hit it, and they don't want to do it again. They don't repeat, they don't sit there and, oh, I forgot about the thing and hit it all the time and challenge it. I wouldn't call it necessary, but it does help to keep any, uh, grasses and bushes and bram brambles off of your electric fence. You obviously either have one really large charger for the perimeter or mm -hmm. a couple. I mean, how big are you talking? For you? I, I've got a one large charger. Jules are kind of key. You might have to help me out with this. Jules, I think, is a British measurement. It's the power the charger has to push the electricity around mm -hmm. your perimeter. High volts, low amps. For these, I've used solar for the netting. Those companies can help you out with that. 
get the biggest, most powerful one that you can. And that's just kind of, you know, you don't have to drop tons and tons of, you know, it doesn't have to be the most expensive, but get the best one that you, that you can. Um, it's definitely, definitely better. I can tell you, it's definitely better to have more electricity going through there and more jewels and more power than it is to have to have less. Yeah. The solar ones are fine, in my experience. They take a little bit more awareness, a little bit more maintenance right. to keep them up and running. Yeah. I've, I've gone the solar route because I don't have a lot of grid if you're interested. There's, the, the, the Premier has a little small, like a half jewel. For those kind of net stuff, the things they were great for that. I think if you train them, and I think that if they uh, are pretty content where they are and they're getting enough food and water and comfort, they feel pretty good about it. Pigs can be individual as well. I have experience. You can get a batch of hogs, and one of them will go test the fence, or one of them will be a little more, you know, kind of ornery. And the others won't, and then you get another batch, and none of them are, or, or whatever. Um, as opposed to, to s certain other animals, y you know, pigs are kind of individual like that, and they and they do have a, a, a strong sense of personality. Um, I'm basing that off off the sheep, which which are like birds. I mean, they they totally flock with one unit, you know. That's fencing. When you're training them, are you doing that like on their weed or? Right away, days after when I train them, I do it when they come to the farm. The, the, once they're here, the feeder pigs when they come so to the farm. You're getting them when they're probably six weeks. I'm getting them when they're when they're weaned. I'm getting them six to eight weeks old, okay. about 40, 50 pound pigs. I mean, most of the ones I've ever gotten have have already been trained to it. Um, they learn real quick. They they. <laughs> <laughs> they do. No, that's true. They do learn quick. They do learn quick. Uh, and especially when, when they're in a smaller area and then you give them a bigger one, they don't really, especially little new pigs, you know, they're not really all about running out and sprinting as far as way as they can. They go out, they go slow, they see the fence, they go to smell it. You know, they're really well grounded and they got that wet little nose and they get popped. Um, you know, and, and like, I had a batch of pigs, they got out, and they did, not necessarily the opposite of what I just said, but they went out, and they were really skittish. Skittish animals are really hard to work with. I've got a steer on the property here. He's a prime example. I won't get into it. Skittish animals can be hard to work with. They went out, and, uh, you know, it's like I said, they, they got hit behind that ear, and they went forward. And they, you know, and I spent hours chasing them and wrangling them up. I had to lasso one, actually. I'm kind of a moment of pride. But, you know, I mean, your animals will, will get out every now and then. It's, it's generally not a, a big deal. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Because usually with, with feeder hogs, it happens sooner rather than later. And they, and they don't, as they get bigger, they themselves are a bigger target for the fence. They want to challenge it less, and they get into a routine, they got it figured out, and this is my space, and this is when you feed me, and so on and so forth. Another thing is that um, I've experienced when most animals get out, they usually spend the rest of the time trying to get back in to where the others are. Um, goats can be an exception, but you know, this netting with chickens, you know, one bird gets out, the rest of the birds are in, they spend the rest of the day circling, trying to get back in. The pigs that have gotten out, and that only happened to me once, and, and it was, a couple of them did, and a couple of them were just, like I said, they were skittish. Um, I've been to plenty of farms to buy pigs, and it's just as you'd said, uh, mom and dad are over here, this is their lot, and the little ones are so small, and they're so, full of life and energy. They're just kind of going back and forth all over the place. And, and they're not, I mean, that's just like a kid. I mean, they're not gonna wanna run away from home. You know, they wanna hang out where food and shelter and they wanna hang out with their parents, you know? So it's generally not a, 
not an issue. I, I don't mean to, to, to speak of it lightly. I mean, certainly you want your animals where you want them, but, um, you know, for, yeah, for the most part, which is a concern of mine, because I, that's not a highway, but this is, for Henderson County, 191 there is a super busy road. So, um, and that's actually one of the reasons I did add, an, add three wires to, to my fencing. You know, if I was up on the mountain somewhere with no neighbors, it, it, it would be a little, a little different, but, but it's a concern here. I think it's a good idea to give little uh, pigs housing, freshly weaned pigs or whatnot. Uh, I think it's a good idea to give them someplace warm and dry. I think it's a good idea to do that for animal, for pigs of all sizes. I find the pigs themselves have less use for housing as they get bigger. Uh, when they're small, they, they do like to go uh, deep bedding, hay or straw or something that's dry. It's important to keep it dry. Um, and it's important to keep it fairly fresh. And then again, then, you know, it's all, it all ties into a system too. And then you take that bedding out and you can compost it or you can put it out in your hog lot and let it degrade and build fertility or you can mulch with it and whatever you, you wanna do. The big reason I have housing, and this is a, a, a personal decision, is, is to give the animals what I like to call home base. So no matter where they are on the farm or where they are in their lot, they're always coming back to this one spot. Um, that way if I need to work them, or especially if I need to load them into a, a trailer to take, you know, or, or have them meet their maker, you know, I've got a spot where I can, where I can do it. Um, we chose to build a, we'll see it in a moment, we chose, chose to build a building out here and you know it also is kind of a multi-purpose shed if it's not the hog lot we don't have hogs well okay now I got dry storage on the other side of the farm if I need it as far as and what I was saying about weather as far as shelter you know the cold cold can be a little bit of an issue with with pigs mainly with new ones who don't have that layer of fat which, which really helps to keep them warm and insulate them. Um, most pigs, I, there's a breed, I forget, I think it's the Ossobaw Island is the exception, but most pigs have really thin hair and it's real coarse and they don't have a lot of it. So it's not, they're not like, you know, they don't have a down like geese or, or wool like sheep or something. So that fat really helps them to, to stay warm. Um, the biggest thing I've found when it's cold is to help keep them dry, and the biggest thing is to get them out of the wind. Um, you know, they're just like, like us. When you walk outside and you got your coat on, it's a brisk winter morning and it's 25 degrees and it's perfectly still and calm and quiet and you got your coat on and you're like, ah, this is nice, you know? Take that same day, add a 20 mile per hour wind out of the north, you're cold. They're the same way. If you can give them a spot to get out of the wind, um, that's fine. I, I've built ig ig igloos for them out of old, rotten, half-rotten hay. Um, you know, I found a truck camper and I stuck it out, you know, like on the back of a truck and just took the door off and put some hay down in there. And that's worked. Um, and it can be something as simple and informal as you know, just some, some evergreen bushes or some boxwoods or just a place to get out of the wind. They'll get up under a tree or up under a log or something as well. Um, in the summer, in the heat, heat worries me personally with the animals more than cold. I think heat's a little bit more of a stressor and a little bit harder for them to escape. You always have to keep in mind it's different for us humans. We're the exception. We like it. 72, 74 degrees. Most of your animals, you know, don't. Pigs are pretty comfortable when it's, you know, 50 degrees out. They don't like that extreme heat. 70, what would be comfortable to us would be a little warm for a pig, is what I mean. Um, fresh water, 
is key. Shade is important. With the pig, you know, obviously is a wallow. They, you know, pigs cannot sweat. They don't have sweat glands. They really love to cool off by rolling around in the water and, and coating themselves with that mud. Uh, and it's great, it's great fun to watch your pigs roll around and all that and stuff. I, I think, I think it's great. And they'll create it, if you have a big enough paddock, they'll absolutely find the low spot or the damp spot or where the water's trickling or whatever, and they'll get themselves a good little hole and, uh, and cool off in it. They really enjoy that. They do like being hosed down. Again, I have housing just so when I load them, and this is going to vary from farm to farm, but this is just what I personally do, but more or less at some point, maybe you will, maybe you won't, but you, if you're selling a hog to a restaurant or to market, at some point you're going to have to have it processed, which means you're going to have to get it on a truck or a trailer or something somehow. Um, what I do is I have that little house, like I said, home base. I lock them in there for, um, with one door and I open another door and I put the trailer there where they can get on it, put their food and the water in the back of the trailer, go away. I walk away for two or three or four days, however long it takes to get them comfortable with going back and forth on and off that trailer and knowing I can go in here and nothing bad is going to happen. You know, I'm not telling you all to do what I do, but those principles, I'm telling you to apply those principles if, if you need to, however you want, however it works for you. I can tell you that, oh gee whiz, I gotta get the pig over here in an hour, well let me hook the trailer up and drive down there and put the pig, put the 400 pound pig on the trailer. That doesn't really work. <laughs> Um, it isn't, this is a little dramatic, but I'm being dramatic on purpose to create a crazy idea just so it'll stick in your head. It wouldn't be much different than if a alien ship landed right there and some guy opened the door and some alien came out and said, hey, hop on board. What I mean is they've never seen that trailer. They've never been experienced to that. So it's gonna be foreign to them. And it's gonna be a lot less stressful for them. Uh, give you a better product in the end and make you happier, make the pigs happier, and it's gonna be a lot safer for them and for you if they can have that experience with the trailer. Um, like I said, the one we're gonna see later, who we're gonna butcher, um, I, I um, put the trailer there, I think two or three days in advance, and I did that, and I put the food right in the front so they could come and smell it and then kind of worked it back a little bit. And they were super hesitant and they weren't willing to hop on board. Put it back there in the back, food and water, they see it, they know, they can smell it, they, they're intelligent enough, they'll figure it out. I came back two, three days later, put the food in the front, they hopped on board, I went behind back, it was easy as shutting the door and I, and I had them. Um, you can go as, you know, and this depends on your scale. This depends on, and it depends on what you want to do. Temple Grandin has a lot of great information out there. She's a woman who's helped build handling facilities and livestock corrals, and she is really great with low stress uh, infrastructures that can help you load animals. Cattle, you can't physically maneuver at all. Sheep, you can if you can get a hold of them. Pigs are kind of right in the middle. Um, you can have a little bit of say so with a pig by physically pushing it. I'm not talking about prods and whips. I just mean like, hey, go over there. But they're right in the middle because at the same time, they're strong and they're low to the ground and um, they can push back too. So, you know, and, and, you'll, and you'll develop that and you'll develop and experience that and develop things that work for you with, with loading, loading animals and getting them to go where you want them to go. Um, you know, like I said, take all that pushing out of it, take the hard part away, have them voluntarily go where you want to go, come behind them, shut the door real quiet. They don't, they don't know, you know, it's, it's real low stress for them because they're used to that trailer. 
and they and it works out for them well. Um, so that's an added, added advantage and a reason that I have housing for them. Um, infrastructure. Um, and your question, your trailer, do you have a ramp or what do you use to get the pigs from there to the end of the trailer? Is it good, good question. Good question. Again, pigs don't have a great vertical. Um, you know, if the ground's here and the top of your trailer's here, that can present an issue. Um, I have a ramp that I built. It, it's, it's, it's here with two walls, so it's an alley. Um, a lot of trailers. How tall are your walls? Uh, three and a half feet, three and a half, four feet, I guess. Um, it, it, helps, it helps when you have an alley like that, if that's a route you go. It helps to have solid sides. It helps that they can't see like a gate like that or something. It helps like they can't see out the sides, like a tunnel vision, you know? It helps that they have solid sides. Um, a lot of trailers have that, uh, oh, I'm, my mind is slipping. The, the crank on the front where you can elevate it, you know, to get it on and off your truck, the jack. And a lot of them were built fairly low to the ground. And if you want, you can stick a prop under that jack. And this is another thing I've done and just crank it up and jack the, uh, block the wheels crank it up, and you can get the back of the trailer really close to the, to the ground. Then your slope, your deck slope, does it does your, go up in it? Your deck is sloped. If it's not too dramatic, they, they're fine. Oh. You know, if it's on a little bit of an angle, it's, it's, they're fine. Um, yeah. Any questions? Um, I want to talk just a moment about, about water. Mm. There's a, I use a pig, a pig nipple and a, and a waterer, and we'll look at it later. That didn't come from Premier or Powerflex. That came from Farm Tech. It's a pipe that comes down to a little piece of metal with, within a, a casing that the pigs can access, and they can push it, and it just gives them a little release, and it shoots water to, right to them. Um, if you keep your hose... A couple things. Pigs won't don't really have the ability to. If you've got a really deep water trough, they don't have a lot of neck motion. There's not like their necks are way up high and then go all the way to the ground, so I can drink all the way to the bottom. So that's something you need to be mindful of if you have just outstanding water like a tub. It needs to be. It's 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 preferable if it is. Uh, got a big radius and it's short to the ground uh, so they can access it and they can get to that water easy. Um, I've been real happy with the waterer. That's another thing I keep by the house. Just another reason for them to come there whenever they need water. And they're perfectly intelligent enough to remember where it is and you can stick it wherever you want. And Do you have pressured water or is it gravity fed? Uh, ours is pressured. I don't see any reason it wouldn't work with with gravity yeah i don't see any reason it wouldn't work with gravity um but i've been happy with that um they'll drink a little water out of their own wallow and they'll drink a little water out of the mud puddle even if they've got fresh clean cool crystal clear water to choose from you know they they do that too but obviously it's it's not a good idea to limit them to that and that's their only source I'm just for an idea that not taking this just five gallon blue um, white barrels, whatever, and uh, you know, food grain ones, and then you can plumb that up with those nipples, and then they'll improve the amount of this fine. Yeah. Put okay. the nipple on the side of the barrel. Well, you got to do some plumbing with PVC, and so, you know, I had on the outside of the fence so that they don't wreck the yeah. barrel or stand, but then you can just. On that end, yeah, yeah. Um, Have you ever used the waters that um, collect a little bowl and they've got with the names I remember they got the they drink it down and they fill up by themselves? Like a, like a 
Yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, put yeah. that on tight. I've not. Um, I've seen them being used, and I've seen them working well. Uh, uh, I've not, but I, I think they'd work too. Um, and it, if they don't destroy your water tub, you know, they'll definitely hop in there too on a hot day and roll around in it as well. The first thing they do is, is knock them over with buckets attached to the fence. Yeah. And the first thing they do is spill the water yeah. and then Try drink it. it out of their wallet. Yeah. If they prefer the dirty water. Yeah. yeah. Just like yeah. I went to the barrels, like I said, they would knock it over and I was filling it up three or four times a day. Screw this. <laughs> but it, 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 it keeps their wallet wet. Yeah. That's their only source of water. Yeah. It just means we have to water them a lot. So I guess we'll maybe see your nipple watering arrangement and see how you have an anchor so we don't destroy it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not anchored as well as I would like. <laughs> we'll go look at what not to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, why not? Yeah, we'll go look at it. Drink out of it. You know, I put it in there and I closed them in. And I sat there and I pushed it. And they saw it. And I sat there and I pushed a little bit more. And they came a little closer. And I pushed it one more time. I backed up about five feet and watched them sit there and drink. <laughs> Once you got one animal who knows what's up, the rest will follow. And this is a little bit of a tangent, but I have a personal theory that intelligence in animals is directly linked with curiosity. It's the first one to go, hmm, what's that thing? Let me go check this out. It's the first one to figure it out. And then all the others learn. I had the same experience. Whenever I pushed it, the person came over to another group. Yeah. Around. And they love it. And they love drinking out of those things, too. So. Um, well, let's talk about breeds. Heritage hogs are a big, hot topic. Are y'all breeding? It sounds like you are. Yeah. Tamworth. 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 Yeah. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Um, I am not breeding. I've never, never bred them. Uh, I've, I've seen it. <laughs> uh, maybe y'all can help me out a little bit here. I, this is, is it, are y'all, is anyone thinking about doing some breeding maybe? I am. This has been my experience with breeding. Breeding animals is a different type of management than just growing them, just growing them out. It's a different type of end result. Um, there can be a marriage. You certainly can breed them and uh, grow them out and eat them all in the same realm and all in the same space and time. Uh, but a lot, a lot of times you're just going for different things when you're breeding versus just buying feeder pigs, growing them out, taking them to process. Um, certain breeds, especially the heritage breeds, heritage are the old, older breeds that, that their genetics haven't been crossed. Uh, they're coming from a lot of your Tamworth, Berkshire, you know, there's a lot of, I guess I'd say British breeds um, that, that do real well and they're in high demand with the public if that's something you're interested in, if you're interested in marketing, because they, they, taste, they taste well, they taste good. Um, and what I mean is that they do well outside, they do well on pasture, they, they want to forage for themselves, they want to wallow, they want to, you know, find the acorns in the fall. They, they want to go through the orchard after the apples and all that. They have a natural inclination to do that. And their genetics are coming from a place that is, clo that is closer to that original pig that where they're all coming from, which is out there in the woods, out there in the wild, that doesn't have anyone worming it, doesn't have anyone feeding it corn doesn't have anyone giving it water nipples, blah, blah, blah. So I just mean that they're more inclined and they're more able to be more thrifty and do better out on range. Um, 
They're more self-sufficient. We started raising hogs ourselves last year, last summer, not the summer, the year before we got or We had two land race Yorkshire mixes, sows, and two um, Tamworth sows with a boar, Tamworth boar. Yeah. So we got to mix them both. And, and uh, we have a local dairy there, not a dairy, but a uh, no distributor that has the old milk, so we get the old milk and we use wheat midlands to mix and feed them. It was very interesting because the, the land race Yorkshire mix would took right to the milk. I mean, it was just instant, you know, and they'd suck it all down. But our handlers, you know, you'd put it there and they didn't really know what to do with it. They didn't like it as much at first. They were very much more natural for grazing and things and uh, pasture, just go out and digging and you know, we were surprised. We, you know, you hear the stories of that stuff, but you know, when you see it happening in that, and and to see the land race Yorkshire develop differently under that kind of diet versus the the Tamworth developing more under the natural diet, and then the taste of the meat is definitely it's not a huge difference, but you know, when you get a taste for it, you can really tell the, the difference. Absolutely, um, and there's going to be. There's going to be breeds that are more suited for your system and for your taste, and going to do be easier with what you want to do. Six, eight, hundred pound boar, and a couple, you know, whatever four, six hundred pound sows around. Those are those are bigger animals. This goes into how much you want to deal with this. But I experienced this with with heritage turkey poultry, and it's the same principles. You can choose to participate in this or not, but but there's a certain amount of, uh, dare I say, obligation sometimes, I think, to cull for ones that have the genetics and have the specifics for that breed, the body structure and, and what they're supposed to look like and, and so on and so forth. It's just like breeding dogs or something, you know, when they have the dog show and they look at all their the tail. And it's the same thing with, with all these animals, too. And you do or don't have to participate in that. Um, and I'm not really even talking about, you know, show pigs. I'm just saying. So what I mean, there's a responsibility to maintain. If you don't breed a heritage animal, there's a responsibility to maintain the quality of that heritage animal and not degrade genetics for the inferior animal. Some breeder somewhere has to do that, period. If we don't, we lose, we lose animals. We lose the integrity. We lose their ability to do all this stuff that we're talking about and that we've all heard about. You lose their ability to be thrifty enough to manage themselves well in their own environment. And as the environment changes, as the climate changes and becomes more different, more varied, it's the same argument with plants and vegetables. Uh, and get thrown more curveballs to have an animal that can deal with that in a better way uh, becomes more and more important. And then if the breeding, if the breeds start subtracting and, and, and that um, authenticity, if you will, of these certain breeds starts going away and the climate starts changing, you know, that, that gets into food security issues. You know, so it's, some breeder somewhere does need to preserve the genetics. Um, and again, you can do whatever you want. Don't, you know, you don't have to feel, if you could do get into breeding and that's not where it goes, you know, you don't have to feel a certain sense of responsibility or, oh, I have to do this. You can get a boy pig and a girl pig and, and have at it. You know, it, it's just, I'm, all I'm saying is that you can take that as far as you want it to go, as far as you want to take it. Well, it's not easy in our situation, if I can share a minute. Sure, please. Uh, in our Tamworth, one of our sows was a little lame when we first got her, about three months old. We thought she'd be a real problem. Uh, she came out of it, did fine. She got pregnant, had wonderful babies. Yeah. And except we had two of them that had, two of the females had a hump back. And it's evidently a real problem. We did a little research on it and uh, it's, they, they can't relate it to anything. The meat was fine. We, I don't, I don't know what it is. We, we're not. We don't. We're not that knowledgeable in to really understand all the dynamics of it. So it's not an easy thing to really know what you're trying to pull out. And, and that was 
those elements. Um, you know, we were going to take out this that sow, harvest her out, but then you know, the pigs are great. Um, then our other our other Tamworth sow isn't is sterile. Right? She hasn't gotten pregnant. Not sure what to do with her. We talked to another guy who said that you know, put the sow and the boar between a fence and allow them because we have the boar and that sow together all the time. So, but he says that you need to try to separate them to develop a attraction or something. You know, oh, the so urinating I'm sorry. Yeah. Maybe something we can do with that. But yeah. So there's and then the humpbacks. We have no idea what the what that is and even how to. Hold that, either we call that sow out or. Um, but our next litter was fine. Yeah. Nobody have, has that. So we don't know if they were injured or if they actually had that particular genetic issue or what. Well, yeah. One of them said that we left the boar in with the babies and said that maybe the boar, the boar has a tendency to kick the kids out with his mm -hmm. nose with, when they're eating, you know, and so it might have flipped one out and broke its back, you know, that was a possibility. Yeah. Because um, they do have trouble walking on their back legs for that, for that. But evidently, there's 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 quite a problem with a humpback. Have, you, have any of you all had any humpbacks in your litters or your pigs? I've not. Um, Are you just talking about that breed or? No, it's evidently, it's a, lot of, a lot of the breeds sure. are, and it's about, the research we did about 10 to 15 percent of some of the pigs, and they don't, they'll come on from about um, as early as about six to eight weeks, but typically around three months, that period's when you really start noticing that. So it's usually after you get the feeder pigs. Um, that we, that we found, but I don't, I don't know, other than that, I don't know. You're definitely going to have different set of challenges when you're breeding. You know, you're going to have sows roll over on piglets, uh, you're going to have sows that are sterile, all that, all that stuff. There's definitely different challenges, as opposed to, let me go buy some pigs, put them in my thing, feed them, grow them, take them away. That's a lot more simpler. And then as a grower, see, I don't have that responsibility of preserving the genetics of whatever breed I get. I don't have that responsibility and now all of a sudden the breeder has that responsibility should he or she choose to go that way uh, in addition to all of the challenges that come with breeding. However, I will say that there is definitely a market for pigs. There is definitely a market for young feeder pigs. Um, I have never ever come across someone who has grown them out and they have had trouble selling them. Um, I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but around here, I think that there's a definite market for that. And I also think that with your heritage breeds, you can, uh, um, you know, they're in more demand. You can, you might, you know, you can get a little bit more for them. And you can also get involved with some organizations that can help do your marketing for you. Uh, if that's a, if that's a way you cho you choose to go. How are the uh, demand for cross feeder pigs in this area? Uh, it's, it's good. You know, there's a demand for pure heritage breeds, and there's a demand for four-way crosses. Uh, you know, and again, it's just mainly folks just growing out some feeders who, who don't. Obviously, your breeds are going to have a, <clears throat> that's going to come into play with the end result and the taste and quality and, and quantity of, of, of your meat. Um, but but there's, a, there's a demand for, for pigs out there, for sure. We're from Murphy, North Carolina, so we're a very limited area and limited market where we're at. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, we find that people either want to feed a pig, they don't care what it is, just you know, to some. give me a pig that I can grow out. Of. Yeah. And then there are a small market for where we're at for heritage, but ours is very small. Um, just yeah, let me share in a couple of, if you're, if you're interested in raising them, um, we do all of ours natural, the bombs, we don't use any of the, well, well the, 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 the they have pins, pens. the burrowing pins, Fair we don't, barrel pins, we don't use any of those, we found that the mothers degrade, but we did pick up our two land race 
Yorkshire sows. They both had 11 pigs. Um, our first ones were January 21st, which was like 12 degrees out when they were born. We had no heat lamps or anything, but we did have the hay and mom and we were a protected area, like you were talking about, free from the wind. And um, they did well, except their tails froze. <laughs> they, they'll freeze off, they'll get a little short. But they, but only six of those lived, I guess, in that first litter. On one mom, but the other mom, only one lived because we removed it. She rolled. And she laid on. She wouldn't even nurse them. She was horrible. Yeah, and so yeah, she just came lunch. Your sows can be a real problem. They can be great mothers or not. So I, you know, I think we found that it, it can vary, and you have to kind of call and We called out that sow because she just was a terrible mom. There is a little bit of a trinity for a food web, you know, for food security. You're always going to need breeders. You're always going to need growers. You're always going to need a market. So just keep in mind that there is a relationship there. There is a duality that can service one another. So, it, so are you going to uh, read the page or are you just thinking about it? And, and, if, you're, and if you kind of are not, what's keeping you from, from doing it? From doing it? I'm still playing with breeds and seeing which ones I like the best. Mm -hmm. uh, I've mainly had crosses. This batch I have now, I have my first purebred pigs. Uh, I've got uh, a bacon type, Berkshire, mm -hmm. and a lard type. I've got some guinea, guinea hogs. Um, and, and, I, and I wanna play with that. I wanna see how well they do. I wanna see how they do when I put them out here and move them every day with the sheep. I wanna see how they do when I take them across the street to the vegetable patch. There isn't any big thing keeping me from it. Uh, feed, feed considerations and carrying, you know, a sow, excuse me, a boar and four or six or eight sows, probably six sows through the winter. Um, that is, that is, Definitely a drawback. And a drawback's the wrong word, but that's something to to factor in there as well. Best I can figure it. Um, yes, there is a market for it. Gestation on the pigs, three months, three weeks, three days. Basically, you can have two litters a year. From what I understand. Okay. Um, you really want to schedule for two because of your weather. Because of your weather. Um, you know, selling the litter off of all of those will pay for that year-long process, and you can start making a little bit of money on your second litter. Um, and then I have to factor in just to, you know, economics. Well, how many do I want to keep? How many do I want to keep and grow out and have as feeder pigs for our little other operation as well? Um, so I guess feed and infrastructure would be my, my biggest considerations. And, and also breeds, you know, what breeds do I wanna play with? Um, um, but I think the market's there. And just tying it into your, your, your form and your situation, what you wanna do there. Um, and and uh, that learning curve, you know, which, you know, y'all are talking about, and I mean, I know it exists, like you're gonna have, you're gonna lose pigs, you're gonna have that happen for whatever reason. So just kind of being ready for that learning curve. Our infrastructure is very simple. We've designed a little hog hut and we stay there and, you know, mom and dad and they raise their pigs and we have 2,000 at one time, basically, with dad and they, uh, it seems to work very soon. We're off, you know, we're not off the grid, but we're in an area where we have no power, so we have to provide, they have to provide for themselves pretty much, but um, that's why weather for us, you know, we really don't want anything born between December and February, December, um, January and February. It's just too hard on the, on the mothers and the babies on it. Because of what you were saying earlier, other than that, you can schedule, and the demand is huge for the feeder pigs in April, May, and June. So yep. it's, sure. You really want to do that. Sure, that's a good market to hit. That schedule. that spring market, and people grow them out in summer and harvest them in the in the fall. That's right. a, so how long does a good market. Grow good question. Um, 
if you, when I get a pig, if I give it feed and don't let the feed run out, I can expect a 300 pound live weight pig in six months. That's about Where are you starting from? 40 pounds? 40, 50 pounds. Now, um, there are folks who don't give their pigs grain. And they give them uh, scraps. And they have enough land and enough space that their pigs are fending for themselves. Again, they're working with breeds. The man I knew of who was doing it was working with Tamworth. They're working with breeds who are more able and more capable to do that. He had a 180 pound pig at 12 months, but he had a lot of lean meat and he didn't have, what's he care? He didn't have any grain into it. That, and, that, and that really is what I would love to get to I got to be kind of patient with myself and take my time with it personally. I have a big interest in that because that's really sustainable pork. And that's really great to add to an agricultural system and working it in there. At the same time, I always have this fear that I'm going to like starve a pig to death. <laughs> 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 but that's the big point, though. You're really going to make sure. I mean, you got to know what you're doing with your pastures and everything. That's, you can get in trouble real quick, yeah. That's getting into precise, serious pig stuff. Well, They're it's, not... It's not... If you have a real... like, I mean, think of all the wild hogs and stuff. I mean, if they have the right environment in the water, they'll, they'll provide for themselves. I couldn't agree more. Guinea hogs were great around the farm, getting any little scraps they had, hanging out on the edges. People weren't... They were, they were feeding them a little, but they weren't giving them free choice, all the grain you want. And they had that ability, because they're a smaller, large type pig, to fend for themselves and to grow and to do well with that minimal amount of feed and that high active amount of foraging for themselves. And they, and they can graze a lot more. Never think of a pig as a bovine. They cannot live off grass. You know, they can't go graze like a cow. The guy I knew who was doing the Tamworth and wasn't graining them was um, running, you know, I don't know, 150 head of cattle. He's moving them twice a day. He had a lot of space to work with, and that really helped him out in that operation. There's no way that we can walk out here, what I'm going to show you in my area, and never give those pigs any food and expect them to make it. <clears throat> you can do it. You can grow pigs like that, but it's going to take an, an added amount of, of management. I wish I had the experience to tell you how to do it. Give me a couple more years and we'll have another class. <laughs> I, hope to, I hope to get there. Um, I hope to get there with just minimal feed and, and maximum conversion. So what are you, I mean, you're feeding grain, so how much are you feeding? I'm feeding a, a non-GMO grain. Um, it's coming out of Stewart's Draft, Virginia, from a company called Sunrise Farm. Yeah, do you, I guess you all know them too. Yeah. Um, well, let's get together and do a big feed order and save on shipping. That's, that's about all. I, I'm dead serious. That's about it. Yeah. Um, I don't think they have any retail place. I think you have to order direct from them. I get order from them. Oh, really? Up in Silo? The guy I got the guineas from told me about that place. I'm still kind of playing with that with the pigs. I give them, you know, when they're smallish now, I probably give them two or three pounds of feed a day. And then some days when I got a lot of scraps per pig, per pig. When I have a lot of kitchen scraps, or when a lot of tomatoes, or, or leftover vegetables, or rotten squash, or whatever is coming in from the garden, I'll give them that. Um, in, all, in all honesty, it's probably best practice to always give your pigs some grain, and to ration it out, and, and, and do all that, and give them X amount, and make sure that they have what they need, nutritionally. Um, I don't want to sound like I don't know what I'm doing or like a hypocrite, but I, you know, I'm playing with that. I give them, I give them a little bit and they eat it and 
I mean, I never make them go incredibly hungry, but I will ease off their grain at times and make them forage a little bit more or make them eat more scraps. Um, so maybe if I'm kind of reading into what you're saying, this time of the year, you may be probably easing off. Yeah. Uh, it's cooler, it's not quite stressful on. Yeah, and then... Maybe in the summertime is when you're not making sure that they're probably getting... Yeah, and then, and then as they grow, too, um, I, I definitely make sure as they're growing up and getting bigger and bigger uh, that they have plenty of, that, that, that they're getting feed every day. Um, originally, I had more or less free choice feed, just, you know, you never let, never let their food run out. And, and that's, that's, that's great. And if you've got the market for that, and if you've got... Uh, you know, if you're not trying to get to a place where your animals, where they don't need the feed, then that's, that's a great option. It's a great way to go. Look out for rodents. I wouldn't recommend having half a ton of feed sitting out in the middle of your field. Um, but, uh, you know, and they really do well on, on, on scraps and kitchen scraps and vegetables that didn't make it and whatnot. They really do good on that too. How much of a difference free choice in their behavior and say just going out, you got 10 pigs and you take them out 20 pounds of feed once a day and, and their behavior then as far as foraging. I mean, I know the obvious answer, but what, what's your, in your experience, how dramatic of a difference was there? Um, well, they, they definitely go for the feed, you know, as much as they can. Um, how, how, much, how much more do they forage when they have less feed? Is that kind of what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, I'm just yeah. kind of curious what you notice in terms of the, the differences between the two. I mean, yeah, I mean, they love green. I know they're going to... Sure. Um, it definitely encourage, encourages them to, to forage a little bit more um, if, you're, if you're giving them just what they need on grain and not over, you know, like you know, you're giving them, this is what you need and that's all you get for today. Go out if you're still hungry and find the rest. It definitely encourages them to do a little bit more grazing, a little bit more rooting, going for acorns and nuts and, and stuff like that. Does that give you more lean meat? Yes, it does. And, and, and also, I think, and we'll look at this later when we're looking at a, at a carcass. Um, I think that not letting your pigs go over a certain weight also has a lot to do with, with how lean your, your meat is. Um, if you give them all the grain they want, and, and really, you know, corn, the starchy stuff, less protein. Um, if you give them all the grain they want and, and let them get over a certain weight, depending on their breed, uh, for most of your bacon type hogs, feeder hogs, that sweet spot is about 250 to 300. If you let them go over that, you're gonna have a much fattier pig. You got the finished weight. I'm talking on the hoof finished weight. You're shooting for about 250 to 300 pounds on a, on a, lo a long, what they call a bacon type hog. On a smaller guinea hog, uh, you know, I hope to get these guys to maybe 200 pounds, 175, 200. Uh, feed can. Uh, I don't know. I've never, I've never done it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I think so. I think you're gonna, you can get a lot more lard and a lot less meat because of the genetics of that animal, who have, who again go back to foraging. Um, and they have less of a need for a higher quality feed because they have less of themselves to, to feed and grow out, you know, you know what I mean? Um, your feed conversion on a hog with grain is about three and a half to one. They'll get about three and a half, three, three and a half pounds to one pound of, of meat. So on a feeder pig, if you're shooting for 300 pounds, you know, you're looking at about you're looking at about a thousand pounds of feed. Um, you know, and as far as feeding, and you know, I don't know if you all are getting into marketing or whatnot, but if you are, those are things to just take into 
consideration. Uh, conventional feed goes for, it all fluctuates. Conventional feed goes for 10, $11 a 50 pound bag at the mill. At the store is probably $15, $17. Sunrise is $13.50. Uh, Reedy Fork Organic is 20 to maybe 22 pounds. When you're bringing it in, again, what's going to get you is shipping. Not what's going to get you, but something you can't control. And it's nice to take <coughs> off is, is shipping. Can you make money at that rate? What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing fairly well. I'm marketing the ones. What I try and do is sell enough animals to pay for one that I want to eat so I don't have to pay for it out of pocket. I can make enough on the others to put a pig in my freezer. That's my personal goal. Some folks don't have any desire at all to market whatsoever. Some folks want to have a thousand pigs and make $10,000. That's, that's fine. Um, I'm selling mine uh, whole. I'm selling whole carcasses. Uh, I generally have the butcher cut that into primal cuts and then I deliver those to chefs in Asheville. I'm small enough that um, all I need is two or three or four chefs to tell them when it's gonna be ready and they are interested and they, and they buy it from me. And I sell it by the pound on the hanging weight, um, which is, you know, again, anywhere from 200, 220 pounds. Certainly you can get it butchered and to ham and pork chops and sausages and have that frozen and sell that direct market at a farmer's market or individually to people who you may know or to chefs or, or whatnot. Uh, there's different ways to do it. You know, obviously you can grow animals out and not want to fool with processing at all and sell somebody a 300 pound or whatever, sell someone an animal. You sell half an animal, mm -hmm. how much time is the retail price? I'm getting about, I'm getting anywhere from 250. I'm getting anywhere from 250 to 350 a pound on a hanging weight, and that pound difference at that weight is can can be a big difference. What I mean, 250 to 350 is is a big difference. So I, I get about three dollars a pound. Personally, when I do it, you know, I'm not really trying to make any money on it. I'm really not. I'm trying to. Uh, put some meat in my freezer and, and, and when I can provide some meat for the farm family. So you're not supporting yourself doing that? But I am supporting myself because I, I make sure that the pigs that I sell, if I get six pigs and I sell X amount, five, four or five, I make sure that, that they cover the cost of all my processing, the cost of the feed, and the cost of me buying the pigs themselves, again, because i got to bring, bring pigs in. What do you pay for processing? What I pay for processing is, the technical term is slaughtering, which is, which they call the kill bill, which is when they, they, they kill it and they eviscerate it. Uh, it's when they take a live animal and do what they do, and then they hang it in the cooler. The kill bill is $50. Is what I pay. I have that done at one of two places. I use Wells Jenkins in Forest City, halfway between here and Shelby. There's another place called Maze Meats, which is north of Hickory, and they're about an hour and a half from here. Are they humane? They are. Maze Meats is the only certified humane facility in the area. I know they're the only certified organic facility. So if you're marking your stuff as organic, you have to take it there. Wells Jenkins, I, I like those guys. I like supporting them. I think they're making progress and making moves to be more humane. I also like them because they've got a nice scalder and they can leave that skin on the carcass uh, with no hair. And your chefs like to have the skin. And the chefs like to have the skin. And for me, you know, the chefs, I'm taking advantage of the new whole animal carcass utilization, butchery, butchered in-house mm -hmm. thing that's going on, which I support and I think it's great, but the chefs want that. Mm -hmm. 
the chefs I'm working with, they don't want a little have one pound packages of ground pork. That's great. You know, they so want a whole thing. Half hogs then or? A whole or half, whatever they prefer. And then they slice and dice in, in halves. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, the reason I don't take them a whole, <laughs> a whole half, let me be clear. <laughs> the, the reason I don't take them a pig in its entirety is for transportation. Because there is a loophole there. Because I can't, I can't fit them into a cooler, and I don't want to put a pig in the back of my truck and fly to downtown Asheville. I, that's not, that's not good food safety stuff. So generally, we have them cut into primal cuts. Okay. And how did you market yourself to these particular restaurants? Did you just go door to door and say, "Hi, here I am"? Or I did with one or two. Uh, word of mouth. Um, the two chefs, really, mainly that I use, are, happen to be pals. Um, I also sell to uh, friends of, of, of ours, my wife and I, mm -hmm. and, and that's another thing that we provide is, here's the cut sheet for, from the slaughter facility. Mm -hmm. Here's when the pig's going to be ready. You know, give them plenty of time to, to, to educate themselves on the cuts they want. Here's you know, if I can hold your hand and help you out on that, you know, I will. Make sure you have freezer space, so on and so forth. And then they fill out that, and then I take the pig, I hand them that, here's how they want it done. They come pick it up, they pay the processor. <clears throat> and we've had six or eight friends do that, and, they, and they've been tickled pink every time, and it's this big thing, and they love to go get their pig. And the ones we have now, um, you know, and I'm not dealing with big, huge numbers. That's important too, because that that would all change if I was. But the How ones many do you have? Do you usually deal with per? Group? I usually per group anywhere from four to eight. Right now, I have seven. Seven. Okay. I have four Berkshires and seven uh, okay. guineas. So, so I've got a small, yes. small operation. Um, you know, and I have the space. And, you know, we could do much more than that, but Your I choose friends, not do to. They buy primal. Do they buy the whole hog, or what? What portion do they usually get? They usually get it cut into however they choose, but chops and hams and but do they sausages. Get the whole, like a half? How do I sell it to them? Yeah. Um, I sell it to them the same way I sell it to the chefs by the weight of the hanging. Well, so, but I mean, does somebody come and they want all the ribs and, and, and um, chops, you know, and then leave the hams for you? I see what you're saying. Uh, no, they they got to deal. They got to deal with it. A they can't. No, they got to deal with a whole hog a whole or a whole or a whole half. Or a whole half. Okay. Yeah, that's. I see that's what you're saying now. Yeah. yeah. You get stuck with all the hard, this hard to market pieces sometimes. Yeah, and that's been a big lesson that I've learned, and it took me a year, a year and a half to learn it. Is that if you're marketing, you have a responsibility to learn cuts of meat, and that's been the same with the, with all the animals. You need to know at least have a foundation. You don't have to be an expert butcher, but you at least have to have a foundation on what's happening with that carcass so you're not stuck with uh, cuts of meat that, that are less desirable. So you don't, oh gee whiz, all my tenderloins and pork chops are sold, but, <laughs> but now I've got, you know, 30 pounds of ground pork that no one seems to want. Um, and just educating yourself and through that marketing can can really can really help as well. Good. What time is it? Quarter eleven. Quarter eleven. Let's take a little break, walk around, and then let's go for a walk and look at some pigs. <laughs>